been a long time. Uh, well, actually, it was end of July that we did this last, and that was on the eve of the Mars 2020 launch. And so much has happened since since that time in our lives, personally, and perhaps all of our lives uh, here on the West Coast, especially. <clears throat> you can hear a growliness in my voice, and it really is from an accumulation of this smoke. I think everyone's got it right now. And uh, outside, it's just, you know, always smoky and hazy. Uh, Charles, who's on, on tonight, also mentioned that Portland was in, and, and Catherine also, that Portland was one of some of the most dangerous air on the planet at over 400 today. Um, which is wow. pretty, pretty humbling. And we have actually a, a, a special person, I don't know if she's been on the podcast before, uh, Beverly Dobell, who is my actual aunt from up in uh, the Victoria area. For many of you, I was born in Victoria, BC, uh, 1962, seems like a, eons ago. And I was adopted. Uh, by Beverly's uh, sister and my biological father adopted me out uh, at birth uh, in the hospital there, of Royal Jubilee Hospital. And I only met uh, all of them, all of my biological family back uh, in the early to mid 90s. So Beverly and I are new, newly acquainted actually over the last 20, 20 plus years. So it's very special to have you here. My, my biological mother passed, we think in about mid-March, maybe late March, uh, was discovered uh, in her flat in April. You know, things have been happening in, in my life in the last eight months as they have all for all of you. It turns out, uh, according to our friend Holly, who's on here, that she was on a podcast and an ad came up for Gaia TV and now I'm a soundbite for Gaia TV. How did that happen? It must be my ancient alien ancestry. But speaking of uh, ancient, um, one of the things that came up in today and has come up in our community, amazingly, uh, the fire chief, of, her name is Mark Brunton. He became like the most seen person in Santa Cruz and San Mateo counties for the last month. So he's the man in the red Cal Fire hat. He's from the foothills of the uh, Nevada City area. And he was a fire chief there. And he became the voice of the CZU complex fire every night. Everyone watched him in his reports. And we contacted again for first time in a long time an official who we all listened carefully to respected what he had to say, didn't call names or do anything nasty in the chat channel. And if something happened, everyone said, shut up. We need to pay attention. This is, this is reality, folks. And for a brief moment, uh, everyone pretty much came to ground in this community around Mark Brunton and everybody else who were, who were helping to save our communities. And it was refreshing. It was both terrifying and traumatizing and uh, unnerving, unhealthy, but we got to see what leadership was. So you went from uh, poor Boulder Creek Fire Department, uh, them sleeping on the floors and uh, having no resources as this thing broke out after these lightning strikes of the 16th of August, this lightning siege it was called. And these guys are just struggling. And a friend of a friend who's working in FEMA and a FEMA task force over the hill just said, hey, we're going to go and help you. They self-organized. They drove all the trucks over. And they uh, organized the fire station. They asked, you know, our fire chief, can we take over? And he said, absolutely. <laughs> we're out of answers here. And these guys self-organized and built a, a beautiful system uh, and save the town of Boulder Creek and all the other towns and save lives, made the decisions early on what to do. We saw leadership. We saw extreme leadership uh, and organization and respectful treatment of people, all those things that uh, we know is in uh, this country and we know is in humanity. 
And so that's one of the things that's come out. But one of the other things that Mark Brunton, so later in when they were about 60% contained, and we had we were just about to uh, what called repopulate this area. It had come out of the red zone, it was in the yellow zone. Mark Brunton came on, he said, let me tell you something. In the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, we uh, do, we have a religion called defensible space. Neighbors help and monitor other neighbors to make sure they've, they've cleared their, la their land, defensible space around their houses. And you might think of, uh, might think of doing this here because most of the 1,000 houses that we lost had very poor defensible space. They were surrounded by brush. They were in the matrix of the forest. And frankly, we're being taught by Mother Nature here in California that we can't do this anymore, that we can't build into the matrix of the forest, that we can't uh, not pay attention to the long history of fire in the West Coast. And then he, he gave us some really interesting clues. He said, uh, if you look at the forests that we're fighting and, and losing in, they're very small trees. Sometimes in my world in British Columbia, we'll call them pecker poles. They're really super skinny trees that just sort of fill in when you, when you log and nobody does any proper replanting. You get these super dense uh, ponderos and uh, fir forests and, that even deer can't get through. And those are unnatural. So he was saying that these kinds of underbrush that we're seeing and these tiny trees and everything, if you went back to California 150, 175 years ago, when native peoples were managing the forests actively, and when the forests had, had adapted to fire, they'd been adapted to fire for millions of years. What you saw in those forests, and there's very few of the, that type of remaining uh, ecosystem left, is large specimen trees, 300 year old oak trees with big canopies, a green, uh, permanently green uh, grasses, not these dried out, uh, uh, you know, European grasses, big trees separated widely. You can see this at Quail Hollow State Park here in the Santa Cruz Mountains. They've actually restored an area to look like historical California oak ecosystems. And when the fires came through, and sometimes they were lit by uh, the native peoples to revivify the landscape. They came through, they generally didn't take the trees because the trees, like redwoods, the oaks were fire adapted and they were large and there wasn't brush right up into their canopy. So they would just burn through the meadowlands and these areas and it would cause a rejuvenation ability for ash to provide phosphorus to the soils and things like that. And and that this was happening continuously, there were fires. What Mark Brunton said is, we may wanna think of looking at the long-term of all our forest lands here on the West Coast and anywhere else and study how they are actually adapted to fire and how we should be living amongst them or next to them. And we need to really do this because the alternative is we lose all these communities. There's nothing we can do about this. We have to come into balance we have to let the forest teach us how it has dealt with climate change. And, you know, and through all this, it was just so nice to be held in the great uh, hands of competent people where they were the voices. And so it is possible to exit this sort of madness that we see on media channels and social media and in our political government and see that there is there are solid people who are solutionist oriented people in this world. And looking north to Canada, I was just on a podcast uh, for a conference in Vancouver coming up. Canada, I think, has had its last COVID death 30 days ago. New Zealand had a small outbreak but hasn't had any cases uh, since until this outbreak. Discipline, uh, countries with discipline that are managing this well. And what we're gonna learn, just as we learn from the wildfires, we're gonna learn from all of this in the COVID epidemic and perhaps one that's more uh, deadly in the next round, uh, who are effective leaders for us and who are not, and we're not gonna put up with it anymore. 
we're going to ask for effective leadership. Because if we don't, it's an existential risk to our communities, to our children, uh, to everything. And in the United States, just because this is the way this country operates, the United States really isn't a country in the way that Canada is. The United States is a patchwork of emergent interest and phenomena that push the state systems, regional things. Uh, it's so large, the population is so large, uh, has a diverse history. Um, it's a huge economy. Its economy faces in different directions. Its central government is actually weak and getting weaker all the time. Uh, and so local interests prevail often. So the United States is a patchwork. It doesn't work as a, as a single unit anymore. If it ever did, it perhaps did in periods of its history. So the United States, I call it the great laboratory rat experiment of humanity. The United States deregulated mortgage borrowing. Look what happened there. The United States goes into these uh, inadvisable foreign conflicts and again and again and again it fails. Uh, and yet it experiments with you know, stem cell research, uh, gene sequencing, space exploration, you know, we just sent a new vehicle to Mars. So it does everything. It, it kind of does everything good, bad, and ugly. It, it's, it's, it's the experiment everybody watches. And, and the world's going to watch as it deals with this existential, non-political, non-ideological thing, the, the virus, which has no opinion it has no attachments uh it's just it's it's a mechanism uh and it's the traditional mechanism of regulating human population and creating change because in a hundred years well really since the 1919 uh, spanish flu we have not had a pandemic on the scale of millions of deaths but for the previous millions of years human evolution was dominated by pandemic events, plagues, uh, local outbreaks of things. It was, it was embedded, it was imbued into our culture, into our religious faith, into how we operated communities. Uh, we were also uh, surrounded by natural catastrophes. Uh, we probably evolved as a single species with one, one um, uh, type of RNA, the uh, mitochondrial RNA from a single mother, from a single individual in South Africa, 135 to 180,000 years ago, because East Africa dried out and became like the Sahara, a climate shock that forced our ancestors, the first modern humans into this very small community, perhaps in the Southern African coast. So and then we radiated back through those deserts into Europe where there was an ice age. There were multiple ice ages. We are creatures of climate change. So we are exquisitely pre-adapted for it. And we're the most intelligent, you know, planning wise, procreative, uh, extraordinarily um, able to coordinate activities, you know, species has ever existed. So we're, we're well equipped for this. Um, but on the other hand, uh, what this event has done, and then I'll, I'll finish and like to open the floor more, more than uh, the previous salons where I just chew up all your time, um, is there is an effect. So when a fire is raging through, and for the people that actually were running from the fire and who are currently running from the fire in Oregon, California, Washington State, who literally are fleeing for their lives, those people, you know, more so than us, where it was a mile away and we evacuated uh, the other way, we didn't go through the fire zone. There's a deep trauma that is imbued with those sort of experiences. Uh, COVID itself has been this rolling traumatic uh, tax on the global nervous system. And I, I'm very interested in checking in with you uh, how this has affected your nervous system. Uh, has it softened you? Has it made you alert or triggered to the smallest thing? Has it expressed as a feeling of hopelessness? 
or maybe in a feeling of calm and slowing down, or maybe all of the above, because it is changing us. We're changed and we're going to emerge changed beings. I think none of us are going to, you know, when the airline flights start and, you know, if, if we get to the point of say normalcy, like New Zealand, um, or perhaps Canada at some point, uh, how many of us really are going to snap back into frenetic lives that we had in 1919? How, how many of us deep in our hearts do we want to go back to that type of life that was building up so intensely from, I would say about 1980 when the sort of economic primacy of the market uh, became our culture, you know, with the coming of the Republican revolution, Wall Street, all that sort of stuff started in the 80s, where certainly in this country, the society turned away from social projects. It was pulled away. It was pulled in another direction where the market was God. And the market has been powering this whole thing ever since, all the way through the 90s internet and the booms and busts and the 2000s and Steve Jobs is, you know, God incarnate for creating Apple and all these innovations. I mean, remember when he was put up as sort of uh, that sort of thing. And so business leaders, entrepreneurs, venture capital, the market leads, you know, Jeff Bezos, you know, what he says or what Elon Musk say are probably more newsworthy than any political leader at this point and more listened to. So the market became dominant. And, but with that, there's this expectation that each of us has to become an entrepreneur. I have a, a friend who wrote a book that every person has to treat their lives like they are a startup company. I'm not sure that's the case, uh, but that was the ethos in those years, in the years of the teens. Everyone needs to run their life like they're a startup. They need to have their own marketing department. They need to have HR, they need to have fundraising. Anyway, uh, I think that that's probably gone. Uh, and that we're not gonna be in this frenetic pace to achieve and accumulate and experience and the festivals are all gone so we can't experience those. Um, the, basically a huge bucket of water was just sort of doused on this whole frenetic activity cloud. At least that's a prediction. You know it's been pretty intense around here. Um, you know we we evacuated pretty quickly and then we had we came back sort of in a circumstance where we really shouldn't have and we had 20 minutes to get all of our stuff together and get out and we took really strange things like bruce packed like five fanny packs but only one pair of underwear i packed a dirty apron a uline catalog like it was just, <laughs> it was really unusual to see our normally high functioning brains under that sort of stress, you know, not sure if the sparks were close by. The fire came about a mile from our home. So it's been, it's been pretty intense. And um, one of the things that I noticed is that I consider myself um, pretty high functioning and super resilient. I'm an entrepreneur and, you know, just have had a lot of, had to manage a lot of high stress situations in my life. And um, uh, and I'm a seven on the Enneagram. I can like multitask, you know, to the moon. And yet this has the, the level of complexity, um, the, the inability to predict, predict what's next, the inability to plan beyond a few days, it seems often. Um, during the day, I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah, I'm gonna, we're execute, we're getting things done, we're getting things, but then at night I lie down and my heart's racing. And so there's this sort of, it all, I, sometimes I don't know if I'm tapped into the sort of the central nervous system of the planet that's kind of going through the same thing or if it's my own, you know, my own thing internally. Um, but there is this, this sort of, it's a sense of whack-a-mole, right? Like complexity has gotten to this critical mass of things that are happening all at once. And um, just as you're sort of kind of getting comfortable with COVID, then comes the fires and or whatever hurricane, right? I mean, the country is in various states of turmoil right now. And then we've got the election coming up. We don't know what that means. And so I feel like my brain is changing in order to respond to this, in order to survive. Um, yesterday morning at 4.30 in the morning, I woke up to smoke, um, a very strong smell of smoke. And so I immediately went online and started checking to see if anything was, you know, happening. We couldn't find anything. 
and um, but I went into almost a form of PTSD. And I like me, like resilient me, and I'm having these response. It's finally gotten to me <laughs> that that I it's it's too much for the for the, for our current configuration with the way we release brain, brain chemicals, right? And so I think we're all sort of getting rewired by the field in some way. Um, and we have an opportunity to really look at it and either let it turn us into, you know, nervous wrecks or make us yet more resilient. Pull up, take deep breaths, do the things we need to do to stay healthy, you know, um, continue to cultivate the, the, the relationships within our tribes, our COVID tribes, and uh, eat healthy foods and, and exercise and do all these things and stay strong and just let your brain sort of, I'm, I'm watching my brain sort of get rewired and keep connecting as much as often as I can to the field and just trying to attune to it. But it's, it's a mess right now. And um, I don't know sometimes if this is the new normal, um or and we're just gonna have to be adjusting all the time and um possibly um things will mellow out and we'll be able to plan beyond a couple of weeks here pretty soon um but with november around the corner who knows and we haven't even mentioned riots all over the country i mean it's it's a critical mass of complexity and so it really is you know we're seeing all these things emerge and i'm, I'm hopeful on one hand for, for two things i think a lot of interesting work's getting done bruce was talking this morning about how you know we got this quiet period we had almost three weeks where we couldn't really do anything except for work on our individual projects and bruce got a ton of work done he got a lot of great thinking done and he was talking today how you know I don't know, the two thinkers you were talking about, Bruce, there, there were like pandemics or plagues or something that gave them an opportunity to step away and do some good thinking. So I'm hoping that as the system complexifies, that also in addition to chaos emerging, that perhaps some new voices will emerge, some leadership voices, some new ways of thinking about things. Um, I'm, I've become very enchanted with metamodernism and Thomas Bjorkman and Lynn Rachel Anderson, um, some of the Nordic Secret is a book that I've been reading and the world we create. And I find it highly inspiring. Um, and so, you know, hopefully during this time, instead of letting the situation melt us, we can find a way to, to let it strengthen us for what's ahead, whatever that might be. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Madhir. Now, Bruce shared this article from the Atlantic a couple of days ago that had a prescription for how we are likely to bungle the uh, the COVID response over the next few months. And the very last bullet point was describing us living in an attitude, an atmosphere with a habituation of horror, and this sense that everything that's going on around us is bombarding us to such a degree that as Catherine is saying, you know, we, we normalize these unacceptable scenarios, um, you know, in a matter of days because, well, we have to, whether it's the political situation, whether it's emergencies, whether it's a health emergency, the frog soup is such that the frog is completely liquefied and a fine, you know, crust at the bottom of the pot that's about to melt off of the stove. And so while, we can speak in circles like this about, you know, we must accept better, we must demand better leadership. We must move into a more pragmatic uh, reality. We need to start by modeling it, um, you know, for each other. Um, you know, in response to, um, oh, who, who was it? It was Melissa's point about, I, you know, the, the voting issue. Well, this is an emergency. And the emergency is that we need to, get the bodies that want to destabilize institutions out of the way. Like that's the only thing that matters right now. Once we can remove that which is degrading the institutions, we can start to deal with solving the bigger problems. Um, but for now, we've got to you know, arrest the, um, the breakdown of these institutions. And that's going to lead us to an interesting moment where we're going to move into a period where post-traumatic growth is possible because right now everybody, everybody is experiencing some kind of trauma. And in recent years, a lot of the discussion has been around post-traumatic stress and living in kind of a place of 
seeing um, you know people in their in their in their pain and seeing people in their vulnerability, and that's important. But trauma is a point of departure, not a destination. And now we're at a point where everybody is in this traumatized place. And so the only story that really matters going into 21, 23, 28, 2030 is how do we accomplish post-traumatic growth? How do we model bringing in the pragmatists from their hiding because there's no incentive to be pragmatic in an environment that's gonna burn you down how do we bring the pragmatists into this discussion? And so it comes down to, I think one, we got to vote. We got to get this, you know, toxic anti-institutionalist cancer out. You know, everything else is, you know, you can deal with after the fact. And then we need to start checking in and, and demanding what are going to be the solutions oriented um, paths for us? How can we model the thought leadership that is ultimately pragmatic and solutions driven? So that's where things like this, you know, are, are, are pretty important. And I, and I think Catherine's recommendations about um, the, the, what did you call it, Catherine? I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes. The metamodernism is really significant. Um, looking for new thinking, looking for a psychology of abundance and growth and modeling that for each other and for our communities will give people the models to start demanding and asking better. Because right now, I, what Bruce and I were talking about, and then I'll close up, all weekend in Oregon, I was just watching people on social media post photographs of the world outside their window and comparing it to Blade Runner. Well, I'm sorry, that's not a very constructive thing to do. And if your only reference for this kind of a disaster is to compare it to a, a consumer product, then we're not going to get very far. So what we need to do is turn these moments of crisis into moments of understanding and pragmatic opportunity and modeling the kind of responsible, boring growth that comes about rather than looking for the chance to be the lead in our own very own dystopian reality TV show. In honor of Terrence, um, he had this wonderful nugget, uh, shiny nugget, his greatest object that I think he attempted to bring back from the crossed over place, which he called the transcendental object at the end of time. And he felt that I think he's big borrowing and stealing all of this from his compadres, one of them being Ralph Abraham. Uh, I'm actually in a dialogue with Rupert Sheldrake at the moment. And what we're doing uh, is trying to really identify uh, a transcendental object at the end of time or out of time. And uh, what I'm working on every single day is a winding up process of looking at how protocells are forming and cycling and how evolution could kick in, the origin of evolution, then the origin of the network, then the origin of memory. This is where we're at in our work in uh, the progenote and the proposal for the progenote, and this will be in this uh, book. And it teaches us that we may have discovered the very engine that cycled up through every living organism powered by the sun's energy for the most part, rising every day in this whapping energy that is jacking up all these molecules and all this communication for 4 billion years, lifting all this complexity through stresses and through adaptation and stresses and adaptation and stresses. And here we are 4 billion years up and Rupert's morphogenetic field or the old ideas of Brahman or uh, Terence's transcendental object, something greater than us, some portal, some kind of strange attractor, which is another thing he borrowed from Ralph, uh, has the power to pull us forward. And the great project that I'm working on that I'll be presenting uh, it, online, uh, probably a little bit later this year, some blogs, but also working with people like getting back in touch with Ken Wilbur and with Rupert and, and other thinkers, newer thinkers, uh, younger, newer thinkers, is if we've smashed biology back to its basic elements and we've blown apart the kernel of what makes a living piece of living matter different from a piece of non-living matter, 
we pull apart those particles and then we find and we see them and we put them back together. We learn about what the emerging phenomenon of life is. And that there's a prediction that we'll be able to make at some point that this field that Catherine was talking about is checking in with the field. It's, it's not that we're checking in with the, the grassy flat patch where our kittens are playing, but that's a field too. But this idea that there's this there's this synchronous wave thing going on that makes improbable things happen all the time. And that if we have a strong intention and a strong desire, the field provides. And it's like an operating system on its own. And you've probably heard me talk about this before. But this field is accompanied by something else, which is a nervous system called, now we have a, a meta nervous system called the internet that is just mature enough to connect humans in dense ways through smartphones, wirelessly, through Zoom and all this, that when you wire together components, and this was the original model for protocell evolution into the progeny into life, when you wire things together in that dense way, it, it rises as a single organism, meta-organism really, if you do that in a forest with mycelial growth, with mushroom uh, growth, it will wire the forest into a single behavior, a meta-organism rises. And perhaps what COVID is doing and what everything is doing is forcing ourselves into more high wiring and more ways to connect in different flows. And it's waking up the meta-organism of humanity as an entity is an animal on its own. And when meta-organisms wake up, they start making moves toward survival. They start exploring phase space toward creative potentials to survive. And they carry everything with them. So the mycelial layers start making a, a redwood forest healthier. They start maintaining old stumps. They start uh, healing even non-redwood trees. The mycelial network together with the forest form what's called a consortium and pushes towards survival and health. Perhaps that is, can happen for the human animal, the human seven point something billion of us, and we don't see it and we won't, we, but we will feel it and we'll see it work. So if by 2030, we can look back and say, we learned something, we evolved, we're better. The meta-organism is, is at work as well as this huge synchronous field thing that's possibly an outcome of all the cycling systems in biology, the substrate of biology. But these are ideas that are just cooking. They're half-baked and they're going to be uh, put into a form, which I'll share with, with you. Uh, and then going to be put through some peer review because it, it may be that we can finally link the reductionist gearhead dial mechanism of how we were made with all of our numinous experience and show how the numinous experience is not denigrated by having a mechanistic source or explanation. It's empowered because then we realize the power of life is greater than we ever could have imagined, that it can create full spiritual experience. The spiritual experience is not coming from alien star systems, sometimes Terence would suggest. It's coming from the living world and the living world is more remarkable than we can know, uh, perhaps, to coin uh, Whitehead. Um, so with that, perhaps that's a sampling of what we'll uh, potentially talk about in Levity Zone 10, because it's in my field. Uh, and it will get us sort of into uh, a bigger process, a bigger vision in a farther future, but maybe a, a here and now because I think there's ways to test this hypothesis in each of our, our own lives. And I proposed this in my 2017 SAND talk. You can see how that first came out. How you can use intention to shape probability and the little marbles of action roll your way. You pick them up and it shapes the probabilistic field again. And amazing outcomes can, can result from that. But that's the, the great tool we have as a species now. And so with that, uh, I think we're at uh, an hour and a half, which is probably a good healthy dose. And thank you for all for staying the whole, the whole time, uh, leaving you with that a uh, little bit more of a positive bump. Uh, 
And is there a silver lining in an orange cloud? Well, we were in a Marscape here last week with the big orange clouds above the Santa Cruz Mountains that Catherine showed me a video of basically the fire erupting around China Grade, uh, which then went down into Big Basin Park and burned 3,000 year old redwood trees all the way up into the canopy. And But when you looked at this time lapse at night, and this is the picture that I used in the, in the advert for this, uh, this uh, podcast, it was, she said, this is so beautiful. This is just, it's, it's, it's beautiful in its terribleness and its power. It's nature cleaning itself out. It's nature like, gosh darn it, I haven't had a fire here in over a century or there's no record of a fire. I'm, it's, it's cleaning out and for refurbishment, for renewal. And when it, when it speaks, when it roars. And there's this tremendous power and there's tremendous renewal in that power, the way the forests always have. Uh, they've been adapted for this kind of fire for 70 million years, 80 million years. And uh, we just sit back in awe and say, this is the, the power of nature doing its process. And if its process is to clean some of us out, reduce our numbers, reduce our, our weight and our, our population, through Darwinian selection, then so be it. Then this, we will learn our lesson that we're not above the laws of, of evolution and natural selection. We're subject to them. And we will look for the benefits, which are a whittling down of the size of our civilization, of waking up, growing up, um, humbling down, uh, and a prior reprioritization that will be done by this force, this power of nature, the biosphere, the Gaian system. And when it gets going in a decade or so with the storms, you know, the reason we had this lightning siege was because of hurricane breaking up. It came up down from Baja and you could see it. It was a cyclonic system. And this is a prediction that's been made for tropical storms crossing from Texas into the Southland and up and from Mexico to deliver rains in the summer and electrical storms. This is the second one we've had in 12 years. Um, but this one was a doozy. But this is like, yeah, wow. So the, the power of hurricanes will now start shaping the West Coast uh, with these uh, 15,000 lightning strikes or whatever it was that terrible night. And it's just, it's an awesome, demonstration of the energetics of the biosphere and it's going to humble us and it's going to it's going to shape us and I think in the end we will look back at the first two decades of the 20th cent 21st century and be in horror that we could have been so immature so misdirected so wasteful uh, so busy so creative we created the nervous system that we're now using but we will feel relief that we were stopped, that we were redirected into a new path. And, and that's, that's what I wanted to complete, conclude with tonight.